without fealty. By that I mean that they own the land outright with no one higher. The crown gave it to them, abdicating the ability of the crown to claim any control of that land whatsoever. No taxes to be paid, no duties to be paid, effectively creating that temple as even more powerful than the Vatican. See, the Vatican only holds its territory by a thing called the Lateran Lateran Treaty that was signed by Catholic dictator Mussolini and remains in force today, uh, which is, by the way, uh, in complete contradiction to the rules of the Hague. That is, under the rules of the Hague and and the principles of law that we're supposed to live, live by, Um, the acts of dictators and the acts of mass murderers are supposed to be abrogated. Not in the case of the Vatican. The Vatican still exists by that. And incidentally, one of the largest annual handouts to the Vatican is still the money paid by Germany in honouring Adolf Hitler in the um, Reich Concordance, the Concordance of the Age of 1933, which remains still in force today. The memory of Adolf Hitler is still honoured every year by the German government when they physically pay money to the Vatican in complete contradiction and heresy to their public statement that they consider Nazism abhorrent. They honour Nazism every year. They honour the Vatican every year when they pay the blood money of Adolf Hitler's right concordant. Extraordinary. So the Vatican does not even have a claim greater than what Henry VIII did for the temple. They own that land. They have their own government. And they are a more powerful body than anybody on the planet because of that. Well... We have an inner temple. We have a middle temple. So the obvious question is, what is the outer temple? Well, 1540 is important because I mentioned 1540 to you earlier as the issue of the third papal bull convocation. And 1540 is also important because during that period we saw uh, the creation of a whole lot of laws by Henry VIII and really the acceleration of the movement created by Martin Luther uh, in protest against the Catholic Church, the protest movement, the Protestant movement, uh, the Reformation, where people stood out and said, I'm not a slave to Rome. I'm not going to support the concept of indulgences and the prepayment of money um, so that I can get to heaven to basically pay money so that my sins are forgiven. Well, what uh, 1540 in the Convocation Papal Bull was about was this concept of salvation. Not salvation as, as it has been promoted ever since. The word was created at this time. But salvage, the word from which it is uh, originated. We think of salvation as reformation. But when it was created, it was created in the concept of salvage. The salvage of souls. Souls lost to the sea, S-double-E, the holy sea. This is the beginnings of the beast of the sea coming onto the land. Well, what has this got to do with the temple, the inner temple, the middle temple, and uh, what we're talking about with Sester KV? Well, the first act of Sester KV was in 1540. Unfortunately, You cannot get a direct copy of the Act through Parliament. You have to go and look at old text where there are some nefarious references to the Act which wholly contradict the uh, 1666 Act in its translation to it being one of creating trusts on the presumptions of one being lost, abandoned, uh, incompetent or dead which is what the 1666 Act. Instead, the references claim that 1540, Sestic AV, had nothing to do with that and was merely an act for collecting of lost rent or lost property. 
So one can't, unfortunately, look at a reliable copy of 1540 and say with certainty that it is, in fact, the original act. So all these things were happening around 1540, and all of them around this concept of salvation, salvage, the salvage of souls, and so on. Well, what is the most valuable asset if you're thinking in terms of an occult banker? Well, the instant reaction people would say is flesh. And we consider that, that, you know, our sweat equity is the thing that is the strongest underwriting. <clears throat> well, to them, the flesh really isn't so much the uh, underwriting as the, the um, surety of performance. The ultimate underwriting is the soul from their perspective. The ultimate asset, the most valuable asset is the soul. And if you look at debt and you look at the nature of debt, then debt really is nothing more than monetized or the stages towards monetizing of sin. So sin becomes debt. Debt becomes money in their system. And when we look at the entire system of the debtism, global debt system, it's nothing more than monetized sin, beginning with the concept of original sin. So salvation, technically, is the salvaging of sin, the monetizing of sin, ultimately, the beginnings of the modern financial system. So let's get back to 1540. What, why is this date relevant, apart from the fact that we see the inner temple, middle temple, create its rules and orders, create a government within the government, create a land within the land, right smack bang in the middle of London, where not even Vatican has more powerful principles than them. The creation of this third uh, testamentary uh, trust through papal bull, which is the convocation, which is the salvaging of souls, and the apparent granting of that crown to Henry VIII. What has the temple got to do with it? Well, we haven't answered what is the boundary of the outer temple yet, have we? We know the inner temple. We know the middle temple. But what about the outer temple boundary? Well, before I answer that, let's consider another feature. What is a building that was based on the principle of three temples, an inner, a middle, and an outer? Well, the most famous one built on an inner, middle, and outer temple was Jerusalem, Temple Mount. The inner temple was for the highest of priests where the sacrifice and, and, and uh, most important rituals were played. The middle temple was for the lesser priests and their attendants. And the outer temple was for the um, general plebs that were at least loyal, the Canaanites, the knights, those that had standing uh, with the priests and had paid their dues and were loyal. And then everyone else basically never got, got a look-see. So that is the most famous example of a inner, middle and outer temple. Well, let's, let's take a clue what they're doing here. What happened in 1540? What they hid in plain sight? What has been in front of us all along and we haven't fully realised what we're looking at? What is the most important spiritual song of the, of the British Empire, sung by kids for hundreds of years? It's not God Save the Queen. It's not God Save the King. It's the song Jerusalem. The song celebrating the creation of new Jerusalem. Not the city, the temple. Well... The outer boundary of the temple is the old city of London. That is the boundary of the temple. Not the fence line of the temple bar, but the boundary of the old city of London. They created London in 1540 into the new temple of Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem is the old city of London with the temple being its spiritual centre in 1540, in the pursuit 
of power. And midst that boundary of the old city of London, we find is the epicenter of banking and is also the epicenter of the courts. The only thing is the royal courts are outside of that boundary. But the Old Bailey, the inns, when you look at the boundary, all of that area there, excluding some of the, the uh, parks there for the Grays Inn, but for all the other inns, it all fits nicely within this, this boundary, which is also called, funnily enough, the square mile, or the square, or the golden square. Well, who considers the golden square to be a significant symbol? That's right, the Masons, <laughs> in plain sight. So what makes the Masons significant? Well, it's a bit like what the Venetians did in creating the imaginary order of the Knights Hospitaliers and creating this entire thing called the Knights of Malta and bringing it to life and sprucing it up in 1783 when they had their massive orgy and the Illuminati. Give people in power, give your politicians, give your bankers, give those people of society a, a, an honour, an inside, and you've got yourself your loyal um, agents. And that's precisely what happened in the creation of the Masons taking the creme of society and giving them an inside so that what they did wouldn't be revealed. So what is this temple? Well, if sin is monetized debt, you need to create banks. And what are the banks doing? They're salvaging. And what are they using as surety? souls and these are chapels now just to add further and it's worth looking at this more and more I mean I know it sounds preposterous but it's in there in plain sight and it is there the original building the original temple is supposed to come from the word templars And it was under the Templars the first bank of England. It's a bank. It's a temple. It's a bank. They converted it, a bank, an ancient bank, the first bank into a temple to deposit what? To deposit souls. So I hope people who are listening to the call and, and as, as extraordinary as these claims seem, I hope you see now that the veil is well and truly lifting and we can see now the apparatus from which the modern financial system that is coming to an end before our eyes in this age, its date of origin, its foundation could well be called 1540, founded on the principle of the soul as the surety, the underwriting, the flesh as performance, sin as the thing that has been monetized, and that it was a deliberate plan, and that is why the world has become and been the way it is for so long. Because the more sin you have, the more it can be converted into debt, the more debt you have, the more it can be converted into money. That is not a model that promotes goodness, that is a model that promotes sin. And if anyone ever needed the evidence that the Roman cult is evil, that the banks are evil, that the Khazars and the Venetians that are the masters of the Roman cult are evil, it is the revelation that this entire system as it was created in converting London to the new Jerusalem temple is a temple to sin. Whole lock, stock and barrel. Well, let's move to another example of their perversion and then I would like to uh, talk about the follow-up and, and how we're going to deal with 
um, the issue of ecclesiastical deed polls and the dishonour 